Hello once again, Ray Bonjour. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our sixth and the last session that will take a panel format. Ça me fait beaucoup de plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. Um, and I, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, this confer the conference's panel um, director. Sorry, uh, doc, Mr. Jonathan Sass. He's the director of the Broadbent Institute in Ottawa. He was also a Sauvé scholar, former editor of Mark News, and a former contributor to the likes of Maisonneuve, National Post, and Rabble.ca. Mr. Sass, thank you. Hey everybody, pleasure to see everybody out. I missed Ezra. Um, sorry, I just don't want to knock this off here. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm incredibly excited uh, about this panel. Joining me on stage are three scholars and indeed uh, practitioners who, using different approaches um, and different technologies, record measure and ultimately help us know and understand the impact that our ubiquitous petrodependence has um, through its use, refuse and exploitation uh, on our environment uh, and indeed ourselves. Um, we don't have much time and I want there to be time for audience questions. Uh, each panelist here has a presentation so I'll introduce them right off the bat. You met Brenda, uh, whose award-winning documentary, Offshore, an interactive website, we're going to get to play around with a little more. Um, Lynn Miller is the founder of Le Nichoir Wild Bird Rehabilitation Center. She will pre uh, present on the logistics of following a bird through an oil spill cleanup station, something she's described as uh, a logistical nightmare. Last but not least, Jennifer Gabris, is that correct? Is that a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology at Goldsmiths University of London and director of the Citizen Scenting and Environmental Practice Project. Jennifer will introduce us to her project Citizen Sense Online, which looks at the relationship between technologies and practices uh, of environmental sensing and citizen engagement. Uh, each speaker will have about 10 minutes, but please hold your questions uh, for each speaker until the end. So without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome Brenda. Thanks very much, and thank you to the conference organizers for putting together such a provocative couple of days. Um, I was told I had seven minutes, and I'm a filmmaker, so I'm going to do more showing than telling. And some of you have already taken a little tour uh, I gave a little while ago through Offshore. As I said then, uh, we have postcards that are on the table. Um, take one home, put it on your fridge, uh, and you can share the URL with uh, as many people as possible. So I'm just going to talk very briefly uh, about the my kind of evolution into working in interactive documentary um, and uh, where some of the major ideas about the design of the interactive documentary came from. So Offshore Evolved is a provocative thought exercise. What if the future is not going to hold some promise of a massive shift away from fossil fuels, but might very well involve the catastrophic burning of every last drop of oil and gas rent from every crack and crevice in the planet? What if? What if the frontiers of oil exploitation became more extreme and our petromodernity just keeps pr proliferating and reproducing itself forever, despite what we know from climate scientists that the consequences of the continual proliferation and expansion of hydrocarbon use will be catastrophic? What if? This is a really different question from those posed within the discourse of climate change activism, where the assumption is that if people kept informed and are given knowledge, will make the rational and obvious choice to transition to alternative sources of energy. And I've been a part of that. I did a film for The Nature of Things with David Suzuki, who we saw looking up at the angels, uh, in 2008 called Weather Report. And it was one of the first climate change documentaries that was produced by the National Film Board. And I followed a very conventional pattern. Um, part of this was had due to pressure from the CBC, but we 
posed the problem, we identified victims, um, and we posed a series of technological and policy options. That's a very kind of conventional way in which these climate, the whole wealth of climate change documentaries that began developing around that time, including Al Gore's film, uh, were organized. Um, and it was really traveling with that film um, and showing it uh, that made me want to step back and really think about that narrative and how useful that narrative is, particularly the assumption about the rationality of our political system, which we've just heard a wonderful panel uh, discussing how irrational it actually is. Um, and I, I wanted to think about ways in which we could expand and rethink the language of activism in a way that spoke to people in different modes. What I did after that documentary was I made two operatic short films about the tar sands, which you can also view online. One is called Carpe Diem, which is about a two-headed fish uh, in Lake Athabasca who will sing to you. And the other is Dead Ducks, about, we already saw the slide earlier this morning, about the episode where the 1600 ducks expired in a tailing pond. And I, my question with that film, too, was very much, um, what was it about this identification with ducks uh, when uh, we know all of the other catastrophic um, effects of the tar sands? What was it that really captured Canadian imaginations? So those ducks do sing. It's an opera and they're very beautifully animated by a friend of mine. So then I came to offshore. Oops, what just happened here? Yeah, there we are. Um, and part of the question that had been guiding this kind of rethinking of new, rethinking of different kinds of ways that media might be used to speak to uh, people about the issue of climate change was that despite the fact that we've had 30 years of climate activism, we have climate conventions every year where there's a whole theater of actors and it's played out with kind of typical endings where the U.S. or Canada intervenes to try to stall an international agreement. Um, we have a wealth of scientific evidence about the effects of climate change, but when you look at the statistics, the only two times that you've had a reduction um, in emissions has been when the Soviet Union fell apart and at the last uh, economic recession. And those were unintended consequences. They weren't deliberate effects of a consensual political activity. So then I thought, well, perhaps the question then had to be reformulated to what is it that keeps us bound to a system, petrocapitalism, petromodernity, uh, whatever we're going to call it, petroculture, when we know that this poses catastrophic catastrophic risk. We know, but we do nothing. And the second part of this thought exercise had to do with the fact that while oil constitutes the ontological basis of our modernity, it is invisible in our everyday life. So the tankers and the oil rigs, the terminals, and the thousands and thousands of miles of pipeline are always elsewhere, even when, as with Line 9, it runs through uh, large metropolitan backyards because this is a cultural and social logic, not a geographic one. A logic lubricated by our collective disavowal that our comfort and ease, our mobility, has nothing to do with ecological devastation in Nigeria or floods in Bangladesh or elevated cancer rates in First Nations communities downstream from the tar sands. And while this disavowal is dependent on the geographical separation of sites of consumption from sites of oil extraction and production, it's also produced through the way in which our petroleum infrastructure has become, as Stephanie uh, has put it so beautifully, embodied memory and habitus for modern humans. But it is simply not quite true that this thrall is never challenged or broken or that our messy, toxic, and deathly dependence on fossil fuels does not become palpably present. Disasters happen. Disasters like the Deepwater Horizon or Lac Megantique uh, closer to home. In both cases, we watch with horror as the technology fails, as the brute materiality of our petro infrastructure becomes tragically apparent. And in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, and I think that there's just a whole study to be done on this issue of visibility, invisibility. Um, what happened during the Deepwater Horizon, of course, and I'm sure you all remember this, was the um, uh, senators pressured BP to release the live feed. 
And we had, we watched for 68 days uh, that video feed where oil was being spewed into the ocean. And it was one of the first, it was kind of this break in this habitus of normality uh, that we live in, where we actually saw the clearly toxic nature of our oil residue. But strangely enough, there's a, a confounding uh, element of disasters, and that is they're forgotten very easily. After 68 days, the well was finally capped, the oil dispersed, at least according to BP and the Obama administration, although not, it should be pointed out, as far as coastal residents and fisher people of the Gulf were concerned, whose health and livelihood continued to be severely impacted. And of course, once that well was capped, media attention moved off to other punctual disasters. And when we were down there actually filming in Louisiana, we heard stories of how they begged the media. I mean, when the disaster was in full thrall, uh, every hotel room was taken. There was media crawling all over the place. As soon as the well was capped, they left. And there's a wonderful story they tell about uh, phoning Katie Couric, who'd been down there and had stayed in their houses and had enjoyed their wonderful southern hospitality. And she said, if you can't find me a happy story, we don't have a story. And they said, there is no happy story. And Katie Couric hung up on them. Um, so the confounding thing about disasters, and there will always be disasters, is how quickly they can be forgotten. With the live feed turned off, mass media attention moved on to other more punctual events, and the world returned to business as usual. The moratorium on exploratory offshore drilling that had been imposed by the U.S. Department of the Interior was lifted after six months. And at the first lease sale after the Deepwater disaster, a record number of Deepwater leases were sold. 11 leases going to BP for a record $237 million. So that was the impetus for offshore. We wanted to insert a reminder of the real materiality of oil and its effects on bodies and ecologies, the people and places of the Gulf. Of course, we knew no self-respecting oil company, we tried, would let us on an oil rig, but they used to before the Deepwater Horizon, like incredibly enough. So we had to design our own. So I've worked with a team of designers in Toronto, and we've created this rig that uh, some of you have already seen as well. Um, what we, our kind of structural metaphor in designing this was the labyrinth. And I think we're really influenced by this idea of how we live inside this habitus but have difficulty imagining another world beyond it. So we wanted to create this kind of visceral, immersive experience where you're trapped, but you become aware of being trapped on this oil rig where, you, where something has happened, it's been deserted, things are pretty creaky, there's a sense with the music and the atmosphere that something foreboding and terrible is either going to happen imminently or has happened. So that emotional quality of it was really important to us as a way to kind of replicate the experience in an emotional way of how we live our petro-modernity. So I don't know, do I have any time to... I have a minute to wrap up, okay. So let me just see here. I might take you down the hatch. Let's see. Seems a good way to end. Yeah, I think. Okay, here's our hatch. Come on. Can you turn that audio up as well? Sometimes it's a little tricky here. There we go. I woke up at 9 o'clock that night. I went and went outside just to check the weather, see how the weather was. I was actually on the phone with my wife. So you're hearing echoes from people who were survivors of the disaster. It kept going and going and getting louder. Which we montaged together. A huge explosion. The explosion uh, literally rips the door from the hinges. Impacts me and takes me to... Okay. Am 
I done? Thank you, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, Wynn Miller will speak to us. Okay, how do we get out of... Okay, start from... Should I just... Should we cancel here? Or? Yeah, cancel. Perfect, and start from the beginning, I guess. Okay, this is a foreign machine. <laughs> Mind you, after Windows 8, I'm seriously starting to think about becoming a Mac person. Just like that when you need to. Okay, uh, wait a minute, do I, uh, what do I do? There should be a mouse here, you know. Um, can you go back to the beginning? Yeah. Okay. You need to go up here. Okay, now I can do this. Okay. Thank you very much for having me come to speak. I think my background's a little different from most of you, and I hope you realize that many of people, especially where there was economics involved, it went right over my head. And I think that's a big problem that we need to address, is that often we don't speak to people. We speak in jargon, we use terminology that sometimes is a little bit daunting, and I was daunted. Okay. So what do I do? I can just... Ah, oh, thank goodness. Okay. So, I woke up this morning in my nice, warm, well-lit, cozy bed, and I went and had a lovely hot shower, and then I made breakfast with my free-range, humanely grown eggs d delivered to the supermarket in a petrochemical-driven vehicle. I checked my email using Windows 8 uh, on my plastic... Modify, you know, modified plastic machine. My whole work, I got on the car, my wonderful little Kia Soul, which is an alien green, because now I'm actually a registered alien in the States, and I thought that was quite a, an appropriate color. But everything about my life that brings normalcy, brings comfort, some sense of place and space, is based on the petrochemical industry. We all buy into it. Even the Amish, if you think about them, they drive their buggies on roads with tar products. So we all, every one of us, buy into it. And when it works, it's tremendous, isn't it? How many of you woke up feeling pretty cosy this morning? We all did. So we have to think about when it does go wrong, it tends to go horribly wrong. But I have to remind you that the horribly wrong may never even make it to the media because the media also likes to have the graphics, have the really high impact, the oil coming out of the wellhead, the, the birds. Doesn't, it looks dreadful. In all of this, too, we, we're forgetting about those 11 people who died. This caused human life loss, and it was dreadful for those families and for those people. Then we... My field, of course, is responding to the birds. And so I was invited to come down and help with the evaluation and look at seeing what we needed. So uh, I ended up out on a boat at one stage, the uh, captain of which uh, swore us to secrecy. He was, of course, contracted to the oil companies for most of his livelihood. And so we went out. And as you can see from this picture, there is booming equipment, and there's also uh, booming shoreline protection equipment all along the shoreline, not in the water. They ran out of anchors to actually hold the stuff in place. So all you needed was a bit of wind, and all of the shoreline protection booming was just literally swept back onto shore. Meanwhile, you have this wonderful diversity of life of uh, birds. I mean, birds are a bit of my passion, but I'm actually quite fond of a lot of other things too. So, <laughs> but in the, in the background... Oil and the oil business run by, excuse me, blokes uh, is all around you. You cannot get away from it down there. And so it was very intriguing from my perspective. Plus it was just damned hot. 
We um, went out, spent time on the water, and of course, moving through Sargasso mats. Can you imagine, as you're looking at some of these images, I also spent several days up in a helicopter, and it's a rather poignant one for me because it flew in Vietnam. And I wasn't allowed in the States for many years because of my protests in, that, in those days against what we were doing to, you know, invade another, not me personally, but you know, my country was also involved because we had troops there. So we, I had the opportunity to see and explore the enormity of what it takes when you're doing an on-scene retrieval. We, if you try and think about it, many of the birds do not want anything to do with you. We're a predator. They know it because our eyes are in the front of our face. And so they're hell-bent on getting the hell away from you. And they've got all these areas they can go and hide in. The turtles, their natural, beha natural behavior takes them to the sargasso mats, which got oil. They were like big sponges of oil. And what did they do? They burnt the mats. Live turtles involved as well. That, I think, was the only time I cried. But if you think about just the enormity of trying to do a retrieval with wild, wildlife in an oiled area, plus wildlife that is still somewhat mobile. Birds can still dive, even if they're somewhat waterlogged. It's not until they get rather sick. And a dear colleague of mine coined the phrase, the golden hour, that time when they're not so debilitated we can't pull them back, but when they're debilitated enough we can catch them. We did these fantastic surveys. and I want to, if you think of it, you know how hot it is down there? And we had... The, um, oh, we're flying in an open door Huey with whoop, whoop, whoop going on overhead and, and everything. Our crew was an army crew and we were flying back late in the afternoon uh, from um, the, flying over the Mississippi Delta and over Lake Pontchartrain. And you know Apocalypse Now, don't you? You all know that movie. That music, and I didn't know it, but all my crew, all of my colleagues had that same music going through our head. All we needed was a Oh, well, I was going to say something rude, a very big gun um, pointing out that door, and we were there. It was the apocalypse now, and that's what it felt like at times, just the enormity of what you face if it got even worse. And I think if you think of what was done with Corexit and the, uh, the toxicology of uh, Corexit is horrendous. I, I don't even want to think about it. But, of course, birds were retrieved. Some of them were little laughing gull chicks, um, the oil was pretty disgusting. And as you can see, my colleague here in her Tyvek suit. Now, if you notice, between her gloves and her Tyvek suit, we have um, good old duct tape, fantastic stuff. But it's because the oil, even though we had no smell, and that was really eerie for me, normally when I deal with petrochemical spills, animals covered in petrochemicals, there's always that smell, right? This was no smell. But the oil itself was so... Um, it's toxic for the skins. It was so um, um, aggressive on the skin, you would get contact dermatitis, even if you handled birds without any gloves. So it was really not a good scene. Um, I, by the way, I adore pelicans, especially the browns. Whites, not so much. They're, they're a bit grumpy. But you get these animals coming in, and they may be stacked crates high coming into a, a centre. And these are the lucky ones in some ways, in some ways not. Um, by the way, sharks took a lot of those birds. Sharks were seen, you know, jaws, do 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 do, down it would go, and next thing the bird that was struggling on the water, it went down too. So I don't know who's doing research on shark toxicology, uh, toxic effects from Corexit and oil. I'd ri really like to know, you know, how they, know how they're doing that. The first thing, of course, you have to evaluate what's, what sort of oil is on that, and of course, chain of evidence. Everything has to be documented because if they can wriggle out of something, they will. So everything is well controlled. Uh, the birds themselves are having to be triaged. If we do not think we can pull you back, we will euthanize you. Um, my boss hates me saying bumped off, but that's basically what you do. You do a lot of bumping off. You know, for people like myself who want to save the planet, I, I set out to save the planet. I'm sure a lot of you did too. And yet most of my job is about killing and killing these animals that we have so profoundly impacted that we can't pull them back. So it's rather depressing at times. So we end up having to monitor ourselves as well because we become victims as well along the whole uh, process if we're not careful. Uh, the birds also, one of the things is, you know, it's, it looks so sexy. We're going to get there and wash them. Well, you know what? 
That may not take place for two or three weeks. You may not physically be able to put that animal through the stress, stress of a wash line. And with this oil in particular at Deepwater Horizon, the, the tarry substance had to be reconstituted. So they went into pre-base before you even washed them. So we had to stabilize. Minimally five days down there, more like two weeks for many of those birds that came in. So can you imagine what it felt like for them sitting there with this crap all over them? Crap's a technical term, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, as, as they're waiting to stabilize, as their blood values are looking sort of somewhat okay, that we can put them through the stress of being washed. The wash lines went all day. Uh, the day I took this photo, it was 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, somebody can translate it into centigrade. I'm living between two worlds at the moment. Canada, I'm really happy in centigrade. I know what cold is. But, you know, when it gets to hot, this was 120 degrees. It's hellish down there. And, of course, we've got all these fans going because you've got to um, keep the wind moving. So, again, using more energy to get rid of things. You have to have water that has very low um, mineral content because it actually can contribute to problems otherwise. And good old dawn. I mean, boy, have they, they use that marketing, don't they? Wow. And, of course, then you dry, and then you start to reorganize these birds ready for release. And that may take weeks. The other thing is, why release them back into an area that's still contaminated? And that was a real big problem. We had to relocate. A bit like the penguins in South Africa. They were taking two or three kilom uh, hundred kilometers down the coast for release. So that the, the thinking was, and it worked for the most part, that by the time they got back, the, the place would be clean. So, you know, there's so many logistics going on, so much going on. You still have deaths. You still have animals that succumb to... Uh, things like aspergillosis, which is a secondary fungal infection. It is devastating. So even maintaining um, antifungals going to these animals can be quite a stress on them as well as you, especially if you're dealing with gannets. So, which leads me on to the gannets, surprisingly enough. Now, when I went down there, and in the aftermath, of course, we know that gannets represent a third of the most impacted species there. And one of the things we're talking about is Canada's petroculture, right? And why am I talking about deep water horizon? That's the Yanks. That's, you know, those are our neighbours to the south. Who gives a rat's bottom for that? Well, I'll tell you why. Every gannet that died was born in Canada. It was a card-carrying Canuck, okay? <laughs> and... We have six colonies here in Canada. We know from data studies, we put little loggers on them and we find out where the little darlings go. We know that 25% of them go down and spend their time in the Gulf. They don't breed for up to five years, so they wait for five years to become really hot chicks and then off they come back to Canada and do their thing. So we also know the greatest impact is likely to be with that generation, those generations one, two, three, and four. And of course... We still really don't know the true impact. What is Deepwater Horizon going to do to our colonies? In the meantime, uh, I have been following Gannett research for some time now, and we know the colonies are crashing. The first year, we actually saw 25% less birds. We lost birds in our study. Birds that I sort of got quite fond of the year before weren't there the next year. And there was odd behavioral shifts going on, just sort of some really weird things going on in the colony. But... You know, nothing you could put a finger on, so I'm still working on that data as well. But it just means that we can't think that something that happens so far away with oil is not going to impact it. It does. Um, we are, we are children of the oil and of the, the oil world. And so therefore, even though, um, Canada is trying to convince us we have a really good, um, environmental policies, things in place to take care of things, the reality is, it doesn't matter. We are impacted at a global level. So even birds that were damaged, destroyed, euthanized, killed by sharks, down in the Gulf, they were ours. They were part of our rich avifauna. And we, we have a responsibility to speak for them as well. So we can't get away from it. We're part of the whole deal. And so, you know, that's my story is We've got to do more about this. We've got to do more research. My own PhD research tells us that there's some very, very damaging things going on at a systemic level. And so I'm continuing that work. It's just that um, I'm getting paid in the States, so hey, 
I'm following the money. Um, <laughs> unless anybody has a better offer. So thank you so much, and I really appreciate the, the chance to be able to share my passion with these animals, and I hope that it gives you just a little glimpse into something that is very, I think, central to all of us, and that's the beauty of the world around us and what responsibility we take on as being sentient, well, some of us are, beings that patrol this earth. Thank you. Um, Jennifer will now uh, present, and then uh, the four of us will have a sort of shorter kind of focused discussion on some of the, the themes and topics that emerge from uh, all of the presentations, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, well, thanks uh, to Jonathan for chairing and to Will um, for inviting me. Um, I did my PhD here with Will in, um, well, a while ago now, not that long ago, but it's great to be back. Um, I'm going to talk about a project um, I'm working on now um, and talk specifically about monitoring for environmental pollution in relation to fracking, um, which raises all kinds of questions about air pollution, um, ultrafine and carcinogenic particles, um, obviously as well as climate change, um, noise and more. But first I thought what I'd do um, is talk a little bit about the project itself just to kind of contextualize some of the work that we're doing. Um, and the, the project, Citizen Sense, is a practice-based research project looking at the rise of environmental sensors to understand um, environments. And one of the kind of key ways in which this technology has developed is to allow citizens, is a term that's used, um, to understand pollution, to understand air pollution, um, other kinds of contaminants that may be in their environments and that they're exposed to on, on quite a kind of local level. Um, and so this is something that we're, we're looking at. Um, there are a lot of claims made for what these technologies are meant to enable, um, to put these kind of monitoring technologies that might once have been the kind of preserve of environmental scientists into the hands of citizens so that they can begin to understand their environments better um, and what kinds of disturbances might be going on there and in turn make claims for environmental change, for environmental policy. But what are these kinds of um, technologies enabling um, and how are they sort of packaged? And there's a whole range of, of kits that we, um, in the first phase of the project, the project started in 2013, are kind of looking at carefully um, and critically, I would say, and thinking about what these technologies suggest they, they offer. So here's a very well-known um, device. Maybe some of you have seen it, um, funded through a Kickstarter campaign called the Air Quality Egg. And the um, kind of platform of this project, if you can see in the, the sort of white bubble on the right there, is problem solved. Um, and it says, do you ever think about the air we breathe? It affects us in ways we can see and also ways we can't. The Air Quality Egg is a project working to make the air we breathe more visible. Simply hang it in your home, office, or outside your window to start collecting your personal air quality data, the Air Quality Egg connects you with a global community of concerned citizens participating in the ongoing air quality conversation. So I think that's quite a lot to um, have in a box, uh, and we wanted to sort of put that to the test. Um, so that's something we've been, we've been looking at, is how do these technologies actually structure participation? To what extent do they connect you up to a community of concerned global citizens? And how might they um, enable types of change? And what, to what extent do they maybe even delimit what um, counts as participation? And here drawing, I guess, on uh, Darren Barney's work, um, where he's written about this in relation to social media. So we've tested a whole range of projects, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about the egg um, in a second. But we, we're also doing this not just in a, a laboratory, but we're also taking these kits out um, into the field. Here's a, an initial pilot walk we ran in um, New Cross Gate, which is in South London, where Goldsmiths is located, which has um, a relatively um, bad air quality, but as does most of London, um, and ha regularly exceeds nitrogen dioxide levels according to EU air quality objectives. So we worked with um, King's Environment Research Group, which is a group of scientists who run the official air quality monitoring sites, 
And these are dispersed um, quite widely across London, and this is something you'll find whenever you're monitoring pollution, is that often monitoring stats depend on official air quality monitoring sites. Um, and something that the citizen-based um, and more portable devices are meant to enable um, is a, a kind of finer-grained um, understanding of what, what you're sort of experiencing in your environment. We also worked with the National Health Service um, as part of this pilot walk um, and borrowed some rather high-end kit to understand things like black carbon and more. And so working with these kind of partners, we arrived at a sense of the kind of pollution that we might be exposed to on this particular walk. Um, and you can see, see the, the kind of darker red is higher levels here of, of black carbon um, just within this one part of South London. But then what do we do with this data? Is this a kind of descriptive approach to help us understand our exposure? Does it work toward other kinds of engagement? And I think this brings up the kind of classic problem that's run through a number of presentations here, which is to what extent does information or data necessarily lead to action? Um, you know, obviously the, with IPCC, kind of that being a problem writ large. So this is very much a project in process. Um, and we are um, testing these technologies, trying to understand what kinds of skills and abilities are needed in order to um, make these technologies run. And we find that actually it's quite interesting how something like the egg um, requires quite a sort of high level of computational knowledge. Um, it's not just an off-the-shelf technology. So there's all kinds of questions about the sorts of communities that might be able to participate, who might be inclined to participate in these DIY monitoring projects. So this is something that um, also raises questions about the kind of data that these projects um, generate. I've spoken to various atmospheric scientists who have approached these DIY to um, technologies with a measure of caution. Um, it's not as easy just to sort of stick a device in the air and hope that it's going to actually generate data that would be accepted, um, for instance, in a kind of legal case and so on. But what you have these communities arguing in a kind of counterway is to say that, well, this isn't just about a kind of accuracy of data. This is about creating um, enough uh, sort of data points where there may not be them um, in order to create pressure so that more monitoring takes place. So there's interesting questions about evidence, I think, that, that come up there. And those uh, now we'll kind of address also in thinking about um, this fracking case study. So the Citizen Sense project is looking at three project areas, uh, the first of which we're looking at pollution sensing. Um, and we've taken what we've sort of found in looking at air pollution in London um, and have moved into thinking about the number of uh, pollution issues that come up in uh, Pennsylvania in relation to fracking. And um, you may be familiar with the Marcellus Shale, actually does extend into uh, southern Ontario, as do a number of the um, shale formations across North America. And in Pennsylvania, there's been quite a, a kind of extensive and um, uh, high uh, rate of production in drilling wells, uh, 13,961 permitted unconventional wells in Pennsylvania. 11,987 of which are horizontal, um, and 7,927 of which are drilled or under development. And at the same time, there have been around 3,331 recorded violations at well sites. So that's quite a high rates of um, some form of, of violation, amounting to fines of approximately $4.9 million. So these violations include everything from failing to dispose of residual waste correctly to discharge of wastewater um, to poor construction of pits and tanks um, and not adopting the um, kind of pollution measures that are in place such that they are. So maybe many people have actually seen uh, the film Gasland and they know about the kind of issues with water um, that have happened. Um, but there's more, more to um, the pollution there than just uh, drinking water, which I'll say a bit about. Um, but it goes without saying that much of this production and leasing of extraction rights is taking place in rural communities that have um, experienced a kind of economic decline. And shale gas presents a way for everyone from retirees to sustainable farmers to school teachers to supplement their incomes um, and to boost these rural economies. 
So the kind of rural idol that um, people might have been attracted to, retiring in these communities, um, has a sort of different way of playing out when you live next to a compressor site, for instance. But the interesting thing, obviously, about Pennsylvania is it has a long history of uh, extractive industry there. It's been one of the primary sites of coal um, extraction. And um, so it's not exactly a kind of clean state, um, but these energy politics and ecologies are played out overlaying these kind of older extractive industries and even bringing up kind of coal pollution into uh, sort of fracking pollution. So these environmental effects include everything from heavy truck traffic um, to well sites, compressor sites, um, which affect air quality uh, with nitrogen dioxides, diesel, ultrafine particles, and more, which contribute to asthma, uh, cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, and indoor and outdoor, outdoor air pollution are among the top 10 um, causes of uh, death uh, worldwide. So these are not just sort of um, passing... Uh, uh, problems with pollution, um, air pollution is a pretty considerable issue. And what's interesting about the compressor sites is, you know, this isn't the kind of strip mining which we've seen many images of. It's not like on the kind of grand infrastructural scale of tar sands. These are more sort of uh, almost a kind of pointillistic infrastructure distributed, much of it taking place underground. It doesn't have the same kind of visual horror that we can direct our attention to. Um, but at the same time, they have effects. So one um, person we interviewed described the kind of stink that came from compressor sites. Another one talked about the metallic and burning taste um, from what they thought might be the cleaning fluids used um, in compressors. And um, people have also suggested that these sites should be called refineries even, since um, refining of gas might be a more accurate description of what goes on here and the associated pollution. So at the same time that we're thinking about how um, digital monitoring in these sites uh, might be a way to investigate how people understand their environments, we found that there were many reports of people having uh, nosebleeds, headaches, dizziness, and other symptoms where um, bodies became ways of, of sensing environments and, and of understanding how to kind of direct uh, attention and concern. Um, and obviously much uh, attention is placed on well sites but this kind of extended infrastructure um, has lots of, of different effects from coming up in tap water um, to um, obviously air, um, noise, and more. So people asking questions about negative harm um, are sort of at a loss of how to actually begin to evidence this. I mean, to what extent is your nosebleed that takes you to the emergency room something that you can actually make a claim about? How do you actually create these correlations? What kind of data is this? How might you um, actually bring this together into something that also is, can be collectivized? And it goes without saying, that fracking is a contentious issue on many levels, something that divides communities and is actually experienced differently depending on where you live. You might be upwind of compressor site, you might be downwind, um, you might live uh, in a site with a contaminated water supply or on a busy road um, or not. So it's a kind of quite different way in which people might even experience the negative effects of fracking, which are unevenly um, distributed. Um, at the same time, I think we've heard a little bit um, in a question that was asked earlier, there's um, over 150 um, often proprietary chemicals used in the drill water uh, for fracking. So um, there's kind of questions about what you can and cannot even monitor when standards might not be set for what is an acceptable exposure um, for certain kinds of uh, chemicals or otherwise. And this is something that's actually been brought up in relation to um, what the De Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania is actually monitoring for, um, because much of what they're monitoring for is not necessarily capturing the whole of uh, kind of pollution exposure that people might be experiencing. So from that, we were looking at what kinds of monitoring practices are already going on, whether they're DIY technologies or otherwise. Um, and we thought this could be an interesting way to see how people are attending to environmental issues. How are they trying to begin to make claims and, and to evidence their experiences? So we found 
there's a whole range of kit that people are using from um, high-end instrumentation for detecting volatile organic compounds in air, water, and soil, um, thermal imaging uh, cameras to detect gases, um, some of this uh, uh, equipment quite expensive um, to detect gases at compressor sites, to um, the well-known uh, bucket brigade, uh, community monitoring activities here you can collect uh, air samples and have them sent up to laboratories to test for VOCs and sulfur compounds. Um, what's kind of interesting is that some of the DIY stuff is particularly kind of responding to this way of um, analyzing pollution by um, making data more immediate. They suggest that the problem with these kinds of technologies is you have to send your sample off to the lab and wait for the results. So you don't have a sense of what you're experiencing right here and right now. But there's quite an array of uh, uh, collection um, and monitoring techniques here, um, collecting water to send off to labs for analysis, um, as well as people taking up uh, monitoring technologies to try to gain a more immediate sense of, of what's going on in this space. So this is where we're at with our very um, initial field work in understanding what are the ways in which people might be experiencing pollution in their environments, how do those materialize? How are those experienced? Um, what are the issues with trying to evidence um, that kind of uh, pollution exposure? What kinds of monitoring practices are taking place? What institutions are those connected up with? Um, what are people actually monitoring for? And what falls outside of the kind of set of monitoring practices? So in this kind of participatory design um, project, then our next sort of set of steps is to do more field work in thinking about what does it mean to monitor here, what capacities might be uh, mobilized in relation to digital technologies, not seeing those as a panacea, um, and I think that's something that uh, is probably quite a kind of liability with a lot of new media as it's seen as a sort of panacea, but we've, we've also heard throughout this event various references made to technology um, being able to kind of help us out of our, our predicament, and I think what this project potentially um, shows is that technology has as many um, kind of new uh, caveats and, and issues to deal with, and it's not in and of itself a kind of uh, savior from, from these kind of environmental issues. But they do potentially make us think about environmental politics and participation more carefully from a practice-based perspective. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that that um, can be a way to think about uh, potentially more expanded and even imaginative forms of environmental engagement. So um, we do have a website that we're constantly trying to update, as well as uh, Twitter and so on. And I'd just like to thank uh, the researchers also working on this project, because it's very much a kind of collaborative undertaking. Norea Calvillo, Helen Pritchard, Tom Keane, and Nick Shapiro. Thanks very much. I'd like to invite the panelists back up, and uh, in light of our time here, it looks like we have about 10 or 15 minutes, so um, I, I will have one sort of question to put to the entire panel here, and then we'll open it up so that you do get some opportunity um, to engage, because uh, I think that's important. Um, I was struck um, by a tension, I think, between... Um, a sort of visibility, invisibility of oil infrastructure and its impacts, um, and then, you know, a discussion of uh, an unease with the ubiquity of oil, all of our implication in it. Um, I think anyone who's been at this conference is probably um, struck by that. Now, you're all working um, with various technologies. You're all experts. Um, what's your role in bridging that? Is it bridgeable? Um, and, and do you sort of have hope in that regard? Go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was really r reminded of the images of the uh, tarred pelicans, which happened at the beginning of the Deepwater Horizon. And what followed that, that created a huge uproar in, uh, internationally. And what happened after that was BP began to close those beaches, uh, journalists were only allowed into certain kind of select areas. Overview aerials were not permitted. There was a real careful 
deliberate, intentional orchestration of what would be made visible. And of course the whole intention of BP with using Corexit, a neurotoxin that's banned in Europe, but was allowed to be used by the EPA in the United States, was to get rid of the evidence, was to make it invisible. I mean the oil, uh, someone this morning talked about every oil spill you only get 25%. I'm not even sure if that was the case in the Gulf. A lot of it is on the bottom of the ocean. There are still storms that happen and tar mats and tar balls are still rolling up on the beaches of Louisiana and Alabama and Florida. So it's not disappeared, it's there, but it's disappeared in terms of the kind of public federal orchestration of the narrative which ends with closure when the well is capped. So I, I really see it as a field of great contradiction in terms of visibility, invisibility. I think it's something that you always want to contextualize very carefully. Um, but I, I do think in thinking about activism, I don't think it's as simple as just showing images, um, but they're an important part of the struggle as well. Yeah, when you, you know, you, well, all of you, personal testimony seems to play into um, um, your work and, um, you know, what, what role can um, telling the stories, um, whether it's the, the shrimp farmers or, you know, you actually watching a bird for five days sit to wait until it's washed, play in um, breaking the general public out of that sort of sleep um, in between knowing how ubiquitous petrochemicals are and, and sort of just, you know, going moment to moment? Um, I think we've lost the battle. We started back in the 60s saying that, uh, you know, the sky's falling. And we bought it. And, and we were out there with our placards trying to stop that sky falling, and it didn't. And I think the um, distrust that is uh, endemic throughout our world now of uh, officialdom, statements from science, wherever, it is taken with a fairly large grain of salt now because it didn't happen when we said it would. So I think we have a hell of a battle ahead of us. And I, I think we need to be humane and passionate and kind. I, the world needs a bit more compassion. Maybe we need to just be a bit more compassionate. And maybe we can reach out human to human, person to person. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer, I want to uh, end and feel free to respond to, to the general question, but you know, you talked about the knowledge to action challenge, basically, um, and you also problematize sort of the looking to technology as, as a, a silver bullet. Um, is it possible to end on a hopeful note of, you know, you're working with something that is allowing monitoring um, that, that might lead to that knowledge to action kind of bridge? Um, you know, are there, are, are there hopeful stories in, in the fracking case in that regard? I mean, I don't know if there are hopeful stories in the, in the fracking case necessarily, but I think what working through practice does help to um, potentially develop is, a, is a, an understanding and um, a, a kind of facility with maybe recasting the knowledge to action problem. Um, maybe it's not a matter of gathering knowledge and then seeing how we can act upon it, mm -hmm. but maybe it's kind of starting in the mess of things um, to what we've kind of already committed to and trying stuff out and having a more kind of experimental attitude where knowledge doesn't have to precede everything. I mean, often I'm asked, well, what can we do to solve this? Um, and I probably think that that's not really the right question either necessarily, or maybe the most um, kind of inventive question, that maybe it's not about a solution, but a set of uh, experimental practices to begin to try out and see what they open up. Um, and part of that is just working with technologies that might be imperfect. Um, they enable some things like monitoring, uh, but they raise all kinds of other questions. So what new capacities need to be built um, in order to make uh, effective environmental uh, practices and politics? So one thing that I found uh, working, you know, just 
really right off the bat with the air pollution stuff is it was um, quite compelling to connect up with other people doing monitoring in a range of capacities from kings to um, the NHS to individuals and citizens in the field and to think about how data is brought to a kind of space of, of relevance and what is involved in that. So it's not just about a message being communicated, it's about communities forming, it's modes of collectivization, it's about creating shared concerns for similar topics and having commitments to doing something about that. So um, it's quite interesting how practice can be a way of asking questions um, as much as kind of offering solutions. Okay. Well, I hope that uh, stimulated um, for all of you some, some ideas for questions. We do have time, uh, I believe, about five, six minutes here. So, yeah, um, perhaps time for two questions. So I'll probably, you know, be even-handed here. Um, sure, we'll, we'll start over here with the gentleman. Uh, hi, Alex from Concordia. Um, it seems like a lot of you dealt with um, the fact that some of the, the effects of pollution are not always visible, or at least they're hidden from us partially, or they're simply invisible like air. Um, I was in uh, Stockholm in uh, Sweden a few years back, and they installed uh, near the water line, uh, like they have meters where you're walking along and you see things like air pollution, uh, water pollution, uh, the amount of certain gases in the air, CO2, uh, everything else. And I was wondering, do you feel like if we tried and make um, like the, inv the invisible information more, more approachable in that kind of sense, like in this kind of thing that they did, do you feel like people would feel more engaged with the issue that maybe they did search deeper if it was like you know readily available like that? And, and perhaps, I know you, someone spoke to, you know, Lac Meg Antique and how these disasters can be so present for us but, and then disappear. So I think that relates to your question, too. It, it, is visibility uh, enough? I mean, I, um, I frequently come up against this kind of question of visibility, and it's obviously quite a kind of compelling initial way to think about what to do with air pollution data and so on. Um, but I'm also somewhat skeptical that a kind of strictly visual approach to information is actually something that would be embodied enough or um, sort of operationalized enough in order to generate different practices and ways of life. So I think in some ways the making thing invisible visible can be a way to shut down different kinds of imaginaries that might emerge around what to do with the lived experience of having asthma in an air polluted um, site next to a compressor, for instance. What might be another way of talking about those experiences that isn't just about visualizing it? And if anything, the environmental um, sets of kind of information we get suffer maybe from an over visualization that is the primary way in which that information comes at us um, and potentially isn't kind of textured or rich enough in how we experience it would be my sort of suggestion. Thank you. Um, and we'll go to the gentleman over here. Oh, yeah, please. Oh, just briefly. Uh, I, I think, Jennifer, you're raising a really important point, which is about narrative and storytelling. And I, I think uh, I am a filmmaker. I believe in the effective power of images. But at the same time, I think, you know, if there's one thing that Ezra Levant said that kind of struck me was about the pornography of the spectacle of environmental degradation. And so I think there's a problem with that. Um, there's, you know, we have a lot of films that are about the spectacle of melting ice, etc. And I think when you push things into that realm of spectacle, it makes for a very passive spectator. You're made to feel that it's inevitable and, you know, we'll all be fiddling while Rome burns, etc. So, uh, you know, there's, there's problems with it. I, I guess like everything, there's problems and there are advantages. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Nicholas, uh, Concordia graduate. Uh, my father uh, graduated from McGill in, uh, in geology, and he told me once that they dr uh, did test drilling on the south shore near the Champlain Bridge for oil because that's the right kind of porous rock. He's the geologist, not me. And uh, I was wondering if any corporation or government would be stupid enough to allow fracking near a new bridge across the uh, St. Lawrence River. Expertise here is on uh, the Lachine Rapids, but um, did, are any of you sort of able to answer that one? No? Okay. 
source. So maybe we'll squeeze in one last question here. Um, my name is Nessa, and I'm a, a student at McGill in Environment and a member of Diverse McGill. And um, so in light of the media um, sort of like newscasters exposing what often is just visible, um, how can we work to expose the invisibilities? And is it that in-depth research reporting has failed us or has fallen apart? Or is it that citizens are just no longer interested in hearing these stories? Okay, and perhaps, uh, you know, we can ask Wynn to take the mantle here. Um, uh, boy. Um, I thought it was awfully interesting that Al Jazeera actually broke the news here in North America that there was mm. toxic uh, fallout from Deepwater Horizon. That, and then it became a media event here. Um, but it, it's always that balancing act. When, when is... When, when do you get fatigued from just having just everything being so negative? And um, <clears throat> I think that's what people do is they switch off. So you have to be very careful, I think, about um, overwhelming people with so many negative things. I, I, I think the problem is, is that most of us are fairly cynical. Well, I know <clears throat> as you hang around with a bunch of us, people who work with wildlife, and we'll, be really, we'll give you a big downer. Because we're so cynical about what we see happening. And unfortunately, we've been working with it for years. We have seen erosion of species, population diversity. We've seen so much happening that, you know, basically, just have another drink. Get over yourselves, is, is what it boils down to. Because it's so, such a difficult situation we're heading into. And it's not just a Canadian situation. It's a global one. We have to think about this as a global issue. Because it's only, uh, is this a 60s thing? It's one planet, folks. This is it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> so, you know, this is what we're at. And, and I think we have to stop thinking locally and really think globally. Who, whose quote was that from? Sorry, I, I apologize to whoever I stole that from. But it's, it's what it boils down to. And how can we reach out person to person, I think? Um, I have lots of other ideas, but they aren't really good for mixed company. So talk to me later. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we're going to wrap that up. Thank you so much to our three panelists. Uh, please give a round of applause, and thank you all. I'm going to ask.